everyone, and welcome to the Only Land Fan Show. My name is Kendall Lejeune, and our guest today is Armand Primji. Armand Primji is from Mumbai, India. He currently resides in London and has been flipping land in the U.S. for the past five years. During the time that Armand has been doing land, he's learned a lot of lessons that he will be talking about on the podcast today. Outside of work, Armand loves to play sports, travel, and spend time with friends and family. Armand, thanks so much for joining us. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you so much, uh, Kendall, for having me on the Only Land Fans podcast. I'm uh, excited to be here and uh, speak to everyone today. Excellent. Well, we're so excited to have you on. So let's just jump right in. Tell us, how did you get started doing land? Uh, that's that's a really good question, one that I get a lot. So I, I, I started land back in 2018. Uh, I was just fresh out of college and I was Googling like side hustles. I was literally Googling like how to get rich, how to make money, how to become a millionaire in real estate, like all these different searches that I found, a blog post of someone that made money buying and selling land. And um, I just bought a few courses and I researched it extensively and, uh, you know, got into the business and uh, started buying and selling small lots and gradually made my way up. But yeah, that's that's the gist of it. Excellent. Looking to make money. What's a good side hustle? Where yeah. make money and land <laughs> land reared its head. I love it. So yeah. uh, you mentioned some courses. What types of courses or mentors, coaches did you have when you first got started in the land space? Yeah. So the first book that I read on land flipping was The Land Flipper by E.B. Farmer. So he was the guy that would buy large tracts of land, subdivide them and sell it for double. So buy for 20, subdivide, sell it for 40. Uh, type of thing. And then I started to research the business model some more. And then I bought Dirt Rich by Mark Podolsky. And I read that book. Uh, and then I bought a few courses. So I did Mark Podolsky's course. I did Ari Tipster. And I did Land Academy. And um, I just learned about the business from all these different coaches and then uh, got into it and then eventually made my own strategy, um, which is which is what I do now. But uh, yeah, that's that's the gist of it. That's fantastic. Yeah, I love borrowing from different people and kind of finding what resonates, what works best for you. And so tell us, what is it that you do now? So uh, now I, I specifically focus on wholesaling land. Um, when I got into the business, I was doing a lot of small deals, buying for one to two thousand, selling for three to five thousand, all cash deals, uh, no real estate agents, doing everything myself. Uh, eventually, I realized that it takes the same amount of time, whether you, you whether you make three grand in a deal or you make 30 grand in a deal. So I started to get into larger pieces of land, like eventually I was buying for three to five, selling for eight to 10, then buying for 10 to 20, selling for 30 to 50, eventually buying for 50 to 100 and selling for 150 to 250 uh, type of thing. And um, then I started to run out of capital. So I was raising money. Uh, I would have somebody put up the, all the funds. I would do all the work and we'd split profits 50-50. Uh, but then what started to happen is I would get these real estate agents that would list the properties for me before I would even close on it myself. And I would get offers and I'd be like, wait a minute, is there a way to use the buyer's money to pay off the seller? And I don't have to take on the risk and buy it myself. And that's when I just naturally got into wholesaling. And ever since then, my business model has pivoted towards wholesaling. And so now I specifically focus on wholesaling large pieces of land. Excellent. So when you say large pieces of land, what's the size range? What's the, the market value of the property? Sure. Um, so, I mean, the, the size range really varies um, from, you know, one to two acres all the way up to 80 acres, 100 acres. Uh, in, in terms of the, the dollar amount, uh, you know, the average land deal today makes me about thirty to $40,000, I would say. Um, I have a few in there that'll make me 70, 80, 100K, but and then some which are like 15, 20 K, but average is probably about 35, 40,000, I would say. Excellent. Very good. And so um, what was that very first deal like for you? Um, you know, where you're actually putting in your own money and you're not quite yeah. sure if this is going to work. I mean, even if it's a thousand bucks, I mean, a thousand bucks at some point when you're first starting out can feel like a lot. So what was that experience like doing that very first deal? Yeah, I mean, it was it was very exciting. I, th I think I've never got more excitement from a land deal than that very first one. 
So I, I got into the business seriously around like October of 2018. That's when I formed my LLC and stuff. And it took me about four months to like get all the system set up, send out my first mailer, start getting some some responses. And my act, actually my first few mailers failed. I didn't get any deals. Um, and then uh, this deal came from a group that I was part of at the time. Uh, someone was trying to, you know, was doing marketing and getting us leads and we'd pay them if, 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 if we did a deal from the leads that were coming in. So this deal, I bought it for 2,600 and I sold it for 4,400 in three days. Um, so I made 1800 bucks. It was again, the most exciting land deal I've done. Um, it, it was just, uh, it, I bought it for cash. I put it up on Facebook marketplace, same day or next day, I had an offer. I met the guy at a, at a, at a, at a Burger King, literally, uh, he arranged for the notary to come out there. I, uh, created the deed on rocketlawyer.com. I printed it out. I brought it with me. I notarized it in front of this guy. He handed me a stack of $4,400 of uh, cash. And I got into my car and I was counting the cash and I was so happy that day. That's probably the happiest day uh, I've had in this entire business, even though yeah. the amount was so small, it's just the excitement, you know? Absolutely. And the fact that you have like a proof of concept, like, oh my gosh, this actually works. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I actually have cash in my hand right now. That's good. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I love it. And nothing like doing deals at fast food restaurants. I, I remember one of my very first deals, I met with a seller at a McDonald's and we signed <laughs> work, <laughs> you know, kids were like running around and stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, this is pretty amazing. So uh, definitely understand the excitement with that. So, you know, obviously it sounds like you've, like you've gone through quite a bit of, of evolution as a land investor from that very first deal. Um, talk to me about what your largest land deal has been like to date. Largest land deal. Uh, I bought it for, I think if, if I remember correctly, I bought it for 475, uh, or, or, or something like that. And I sold it for 625. So the, the spread on that was about 150 K. Uh, and then after like commissions and closing costs and everything else, uh, made, I made six figures on that deal, but, uh, that has been my largest one to date. Excellent. And so how many deals had you done before that, before you got to that large? Mm, I think I've done about maybe 25, 30 deals before I got to that one. Got it. Got it. So you weren't like, oh gosh, I don't know if this is going to work. You already knew that it was going to work, right? But yeah. There had to yeah. have been some type of a uh, little bit of anxiety about like, I have $425,000 in this deal. I'm assuming you raised some some funds for that one. Actually, that was that was after I already got into wholesaling. So, um, you know, it, the the buyer wired their six hundred and something k, and then the the title company paid off the seller, and then whatever was remaining after closing cost commission, they just sent me a wire transfer. So, I I, I made six with with no investment. It was great. <laughs> Even better. I love that. You mentioned yeah. that your first few mailers failed when you started. How many did you send out and? and kind of walk us through the numbers of, of what those first few mailing campaigns look like. Yeah. I mean, they were so tiny. I would, I was so scared because I, I didn't even like, I, I mean, I knew the business work because I heard in podcasts, other people having success and I'd read enough about it to know that it, there's no way so many people can be talking about a business that, that doesn't actually work. So I had, I had some skepticism, but I, you know, I just, I went into it and I started mailing very small amounts. I was mailing 100, 200, 300 mailers at a time. And I, I would get calls from motivated sellers. So I knew that there was opportunity, but I just never really landed any like good deals that, that passed all the tests. And then, you know, slowly I, I, I ramped that up to like sending out a thousand, then 5,000, then 10,000. And now, you know, 40, 50, 60,000 mailers uh, at, at, at one go. It's usually Excellent. where I'm at. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So um, definitely, definitely know what the value of scaling that marketing machine looks like. Right. Um, so what would you say to someone that says, you know, like, Hey, listen, I've mailed a few months. I sent out, you know, three or 4,000 mailers a month. And uh, you know, it's been three months. I've gotten nothing. What, what would you say to those people? Do, would you say just, you know, pack it up and move on and go try crypto or what would you, what would you, uh... Yeah. I mean, one thing I would say is that this business isn't for everybody. And, you know, I've, I've tried to help a lot of people. I've, I've, you know, spoken to a lot of people, but I've given people the guidance and, and the footprint. But one thing I've realized is that, you know, I thought that if I showed my system to others and taught them exactly how I know that 
they would have success. But what I learned is it really varies from person to person. Like there are some people that took my advice and did very well with it. And then there are others that didn't. And I think it's, it just depends on you as a person, you know, if you're someone that loves taking risks, that doesn't mind putting all your chips on the table and, and, and just, you know, uh, because this business, it's, it's, it, it can be very unforgiving at times. Like, you know, you, you, there, there will be times where you send mailers and they just don't go as planned. Um, and, and, and you will lose money, but it's just about having that grit and that fortitude and that mindset that I'm not going to give up. I'm going to figure out what went wrong. I'm going to tweak my offer prices. I'm going to tweak the areas I'm mailing. I'm going to improve my letter. It, you know, it, being in a mindset where you're constantly trying to learn and get better. And it's really those people that that succeed, I think, in, in the long run. Yeah, I agree with that. There's so much great information in there. Uh, you know, just the whole idea of like testing and pivoting and reiterating and testing and pivoting, reiterating. What works this month may not work in three months, right? Um, Absolutely. You know, I've heard it said from many people before, uh, many of my colleagues, that if you haven't lost money on marketing yet, you're not doing enough marketing. <laughs> yeah. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that 100%. You know, you, you, you have to be willing to, to, to roll the dice. And just something that I noticed, you know, when, when, I, when I first got into the business, I was able to find deals for, you know, 20, 25% of, of, of market value. You know, if, if you use that same old approach today and you send out 10,000 mailers and you don't get any deals, well, guess what? I'm not surprised because the market's changed, the environment's changed. And, you know, you have to be willing to, to adapt and, and make yourself competitive. And usually if you're getting too few responses, it's because your offer prices are too low. If you're getting too many responses, it's probably because you offer too much. And that's just something that comes with trial and error and, and really experimenting. So, yeah, that's a very good point. You know, I think one of the things that there's, and I know I missed this when I first started was, you know, I kind of looked at this business as like, hey, I'm checking the boxes, I'm doing everything, but nothing's happening, right? Yeah. As opposed to looking at the feedback that the marketing was actually providing and saying, like you just said, oh, I'm getting not enough responses. Well, maybe my offers are too low and then using that information to pivot. So uh, that's a really good point. So you mentioned grit, you mentioned the, uh, you know, the willingness to, to take risk and the willingness to implement different things and try different things. What would you say are the most important skills to have in the land industry? The most important skills, I think one is technical skills, is being really good at Excel. Um, and if you're not, you know, really taking that time to, to really learn how it works, how to use like VLOOKUP, pivot tables, uh, all these functions, filters, uh, sorting and filtering, because all this stuff is, it'll just help make the experience so much faster and so much less painful. Um, so like being good at Excel is something that I, I would highly, highly recommend um, because, you know, at the end of the day, you are looking at a lot of data and a good mailer versus a bad mailer can, you know, really make or break your business. Um, so that's, that's, that is a huge one. I think the other thing is just, um, you know, being a good negotiator, knowing how to talk to people, having good, like people skills, negotiation skills, being empathetic, um, you know, cause many times when you're speaking to people, they're sharing their life story, they're telling you about their problems and just being a good listener, uh, and just being like a likable person, I think goes such a long way, um, in this business. I mean, I still have buyers and sellers from five years ago from deals that I initially did still calling me up to like catch up and just ask me about life. And I think, you know, building that relationship is, uh, you know, having the ability to build relationships uh, in this business is huge. And, and it just goes such a long way, you know, not just with the buyers and sellers, but even with their realtors, with your title companies. Um, yeah, I, I think it makes a huge difference. So I would say those are the two biggest things. Yeah, that's fantastic. I definitely agree with you. Relationships. I mean, it's just king, right? It's king yeah. in business. And, um, you know, it's one thing to be able to figure out a deal and to make a deal happen, but it's a completely other thing to actually scale it, make it into a business and realize that as a business, you actually have customers, your, your sellers are customers. And, and like you mentioned, it's important to nurture those relationships. So I think that's really fantastic advice. So let's get into some nuts and bolts really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, how do you go about picking a target area to do deals? Um, so I would say this has changed a lot over the years. Uh, when I first got into the business, I was looking 
you know, I was just mailing individual counties at the time. So I was looking at things like population growth. I would go on citydata.com. I'd look at, you know, crime, median household income. I would look at what, what states and, and counties have growth. And, and I would, you know, really try and be in secondary markets. So I'd say, you know, 45 minutes to an hour and a half out of big cities is really where I'd like to be. Um, and I would try and mail those counties where there was growth and where I knew that I could sell land quickly. Uh, obviously, as I grew and I needed more and more counties to mail, um, I, then I just started mailing in dire states. So I'll just, you know, uh, if I if I like a state and I know that that state holistically is experiencing a lot of growth, a lot of people are moving to that state. I just mail the entire state and I today I just keep it very broad. Um, I don't target specifically residential, commercial, industrial. I, I mail everybody and I just see what I can get. Excellent. And so yeah. do you, uh, so it sounds like you've simplified, simplified your approach from how yes. you're picking target markets from the beginning of your, from the beginning of your career. Mm -hmm. uh, do you target uh, specific sizes of properties? It sounds like you just kind of target all of the zoning, uh, but are there sizes that you, that you look for or? Yeah. So, so typically, typically about half an acre is half an acre and up is, is, is what I look for. Uh, I mean, in certain cases, I'll even go like 0.25 acres and up, but typically half an acre and uh, up is, is, is what I go for usually. And then in, in assessed value, at least, you know, uh, 50,000 and up. Excellent. And so for those that, um, may be listening to this for the first time and saying, well, you know, how do you, you know, how do you hone in on what's going to be a good deal versus a bad deal? What are the, what's the criteria that you go through when you're looking to analyze and evaluate these deals? Okay. That, that is a very good question. Um, and I think I've built an eye for it. Like I, I think it, it comes with experience and just looking at enough deals, but some of the things that very quickly I can see when I pull up a piece of land. So I'll use a uh, parcel fact. That's the software that I use to, to look these up. I know there's a, a few others that people use as well. Um, but parcel fact is just what I'm comfortable with. So I'll, I'll pull it up on there and I'll, I'll look at the uh, satellite view and I'll look at the first thing I look at is, is there road access to this land? Cause that's, that's key, right? I want to make sure that there's legal access, physical access, uh, cause you know, without that, it, it, it is going to become a, a trickier deal. That's the first thing I look at. The second thing I look at is, is it in a flood zone? Uh, which fossil fact again uh, very quickly can can show me like a flood zone map and see if that overlaps with the land. The third thing is is it on a slope? Um, so you know obviously if it's if it's on a cliff, it's it's going to be harder to build on it versus if it's like flatter land. Um, and then the and and again this is one of the most important things that I look at is is there other activity going on in that area? So if I see a piece of land. It appears to be landlocked. It's middle of nowhere. There's no other real estate development, anything happening. It's all just barren land all around it. I know that 99% I'm going to have a really hard time selling it. And it's probably just going to be sitting on the market, um, you know, for a year with no offer. So th those are typically bad deals. But if I see like that, this one piece of land has not been built on, but like stuff around it is being built on and, you know, it's like quite urban that area, then I know it's going to be a, a better deal. So I just look for growth and, and construction happening around that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a fantastic point. You know, I think that there's so much land out there that it's super easy to get under contract, but it may not be very easy to move it. Right. And so yeah. thinking about the end in mind, I think is so important. Um, now, you mentioned flood zone. I want to dig into that a little bit deeper. Is that a complete deal breaker for you or? Does it just affect the value that you're going to offer or what is it? How do you, how yeah. do you flood zone? So flood zone, this is very interesting. I know a lot of people take flood zone off their list. I intentionally mail flood zone because some of my best deals, believe it or not, have actually been flood zone properties. Um, some of those deals where I bought for 50, sold for one deal, I bought it for just over 50k I sold it for 165k it was in a flood zone and I'm guessing that's probably why many people didn't many land investors didn't mail that 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 one landowner and and I was open to flood zone so I got it and I found someone that was willing to buy it and and I made a good spread on it and yeah flood zone I'm, I'm very much open to it um I don't drill it out at all because 
um, you know, one man's problem is, is another man's treasure. And you'll always find a buyer. There's always one buyer, right. Who's, who's willing to overcome the challenges and yeah. So. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's really, really good insight. Um, so what is it that you like to use as far as marketing, um, to find your deals? What marketing channels? You mentioned mail. Do you do any type of texting, ringless voicemail, digital ads? What what type of marketing channels do you like to use? Yeah, so I haven't actually looked at, at any of the other ones. Uh, to be completely honest, uh, ever since I got into the business, it's always been direct mail. Um, it's just what's worked for me. It's It's been effective at getting me deals. Um, so yeah, I haven't really felt compelled to use anything else. My direct mail campaigns, uh, when I initially got into the business, I was doing postcards. And then I realized that that was getting me just um, too many people wanting offers. And then I'd have to do due diligence and then make them an offer. And I was spending a lot of time and I felt like I was becoming an appraiser instead of a land investor. So the blind offer template, uh, when I switched to that, that was like a huge uh, benefit to me because suddenly I was already making an offer and I was eliminating all the non-motivated sellers and only targeting very specific sellers and the people I'd get callbacks from were usually uh, motivated sellers. So uh, the blind offer template, just a two page letter, the first page is a couple letter, the second page is my offer. And uh, that's that's been the recipe of uh, success for me. Excellent. So you mentioned that at one point you're sending 40, 50, 60,000 mail pieces in a mm -hmm. campaign, right? And so, um, so I'm assuming that's 50, 60,000 blind offers that you're sending. How do you streamline that? What's your process like uh, to, to get to those blind offers? Yeah, uh, very good question. So uh, I, I realized that, um, you know, I, it was just, I would send 10,000 a month and that was, that was what was achievable for me uh, to like manage on my own. But the moment I started ramping that up, I found myself getting burnt out, honestly, and I realized that I should have done this a long time ago. But uh, I started hiring people uh, in my business to to help with with different tasks. So the way I have it organized now is I'm the CEO. I have a COO that is uh, fully trained by me. He knows the business inside and out. And then under him, we have transaction coordinators who are uh, you know helping with talking to the sellers and responding to those initial calls that come in. So, you know, my, my, my goal at this point in my business is I just send direct mail and the team takes care of everything else um, at this point. And they're all structured on commission. So it doesn't cost me any salary to, to have these people on. They, they only get paid when, when I get paid. So uh, it's definitely a win-win a, a situation, I would say. Excellent. So you have people on your staff that are kind of calculating these blind offers. Is that right? So I calculate the blind offers when I send that initial direct mail campaign. Uh, and then if someone comes back and, you know, makes a counter offer, then, you know, I've trained the, the team on how to go about, uh, uh, you know, approaching those sellers. Um, and, you know, all the marketing is honestly done through real estate agents. So like, let's say we, someone owns the land for hundred grand, we offer them 30 grand. Uh, they come back and say, we want 50K for it. So I'll have my employee reach out to my real estate agent, ask them for their opinion. And then I have a formula where, you know, if it, if it meets the parameters and if we can make a sufficient profit on it, then yes, they can go ahead and offer the seller 50K. And then my team takes it all the way from when it's listed all the way through through closing. Wow, that's fantastic. So you actually have agents on that dispo side to negotiate on your behalf. Right. Yes, agents on the dispo side, and then my staff is actually managing the agent, monitoring the list prices. If it's not selling, they're constantly lowering the list price till we eventually get get to a sale. So just having a team that's very proactively managing all these listings, because that's honestly the the only way that you can scale. Um, you know, sending fifty, sixty thousand mailers a month and just having it all fall on me would uh, would just not be would just not be fun. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> definitely a lot. So um, for those that may be listening and, and that are newer to this business and they're struggling with, you know, let's say they're in a brand new area, a brand new target market. They're not quite sure what the values of properties are, but they know they want to send 5000 mailers to this particular area. What would you advise them to do in order to figure out what those blind offers should be when they're sending out those 5000 mail pieces? Yeah, that, that that is a really good question. Um, 
I used to initially uh, do avoid this issues. I only used to mail counties which had very good assessor data. So like uh, I started off in Texas. Uh, Texas is a non-disclosure state. Uh, typically the, the best like indication of market value is what the assessors have. Um, so I would just use the assessed values and just go off that. And I would say in my experience, I don't know how it is now, but back then 80 to 90% of the time, it was pretty accurate. So I would just base my offers off the assessed value. Um, now I use a, a tool called Priced that prices all my offers for me. And, and this has really allowed me to branch off into other states where um, maybe the assessors don't have the best data. Excellent. Excellent. Love that. Mm -hmm. And um, so let's talk a little bit about um, about technology and how you use that in your business. So um, I did see in your bio that uh, that CRM is kind of has sort of a, a, uh, a sweet spot in your heart. Right. Can you talk yes. a little bit about CRMs and what you use and, and how you go about setting up your CRM? Yeah, so I use a CRM called Podio, and that's just worked very well for me. Uh, it in my land business, I set it up very early early on, and uh, I use it for everything from you know keeping track of all the all the contact info of all the realtors, the escrow officers, all the sellers, buyers. Uh, everything is in there. My entire pipeline, my buyers list, um, everything related to my business is in Podio. It, it calculates and tells me my my monthly revenue, my annual revenue, uh, how many deals I have coming up, what day I have, which closing, how much I'm expected to make on each closing. Um, and it's just a very good tool to like even aggregate data. So if I want to see example in the last five years, how many deals I've done in a specific county, it'll give me all that data. So it's just a very good CRM um, and I can extract a lot of data uh, out of it. So yeah, that, that's one one. Very good. And Podio, uh, from what I understand, is pretty customizable, right? So based on yeah. what you need in your business, you can customize that platform for the interface. Absolutely. And it, it, there's so much automation that you can do with it as well. Like you can have it generate purchase and sale agreements. So if you make an offer for 30K, he comes back at 50K and you want to send him a purchase and sale agreement at 50K, it's literally one click and it generates the contract, sends it out to the guy for signing. It's it's uh, You can automate everything. Um, and, and a huge, uh, a very big use case for me is also with uh, all the incoming calls. Uh, I use a call answering service called Bat Live. So all the calls that the Bat Live agents receive feeds into Podio, uh, feeds into a web form. So I can actually see those calls on my CRM and look at how many calls came in on which day and, you know, make sure my team's responding to those calls. So, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Automation. Gotta love it. Gotta love it. So Absolutely. <laughs> Speaking of automation, can you talk a little bit about what the volume is like in your business a month um, in your wholesale business? Uh, it, it really varies. Uh, this month, we have about four to five closings happening. Uh, but probably average, I would say, is three to five, three to five a month. Very good. And do you do only wholesale deals or do you ever create notes or any type of creative financing or is wholesaling kind of it? It is wholesaling only buyers have to be fully funded at closing. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So let's dig into the dispo side of things. Uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. that you work with agents to, to help uh, come up with some values on the acquisition side as well. I'm assuming that you're using those same agents on the dispo side. Uh, it, it, actually, it's the it's the I, I just have agents that I use for for the dispo the acquisition is done by my uh, staff uh, staff in-house so they'll get it on the contract then they'll send it to the agent the agent will tell us we can list it for x amount and then we put post it on the on the MLS and then when we get offers we do double closings essentially got it got it yeah. and so those agents um how do you pay them or do you pay them commission or how yeah. do you these agents get paid strictly on commission. Uh, I don't. I know some agents charge even for giving like a broker's opinion of value. Uh, but you know, my agents work strictly off commission, um, and I pay them anywhere from on the lower end six percent uh, to the higher highest I'll ever pay an agent is ten percent. Uh, but you know, that's again if they're a really good agent, if they're you know going seeing the land in person getting drone photography having awesome description doing a bunch of due diligence so if they're really putting themselves out there i'll give them 10 otherwise six percent is, is uh, pretty standard 
Excellent. So I do have a question in regard to wholesaling and using agents. So these agents are acting as the listing agents, right? For these properties. Correct. Yes. Got it. And so I'm assuming these are wholesale friendly agents because not all of them are right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So they, so I'm assuming they just allow you to, uh, they, they will accept a, an equitable interest, right. To be able to post these. Yes, yes. And, you know, there's a few things that I've done to, to, you know, try my best to mitigate risk there is firstly is uh, I, I make it very clear to the sellers in my offer letter that, you know, I am a wholesaler, it is my intent to, to buy this and resell it to, to somebody else, just because I want them, I just want to be honest with them about that. I don't want them to see that property in the MLS and be like, what the hell are you guys doing? I, I thought you were going to buy this directly for me. So I'm very honest with them about that. And, and even in my in my actual purchase and sale agreement, I have it on the special provisions mentioned that, you know, I am getting permission from them to list it, to market it, to advertise it, inspect it. I'm getting all those permissions in the contract itself. So when I show that contract to the agents, they feel a lot more comfortable uh, working with me as a wholesaler because I'm being honest with the sellers and I'm creating a fully transparent business. Um, and, you know, most of the time the sellers don't really care. Like if, if a seller is motivated and, and they're happy with the offer you're giving them, they're happy with the price, they're just going to sign it. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I post it on the MLS, we get offers, and then um, I do a, a simultaneous closing. So either same day or next day closing. Excellent. Yeah, I love the transparency of making sure that the sellers understand what your intentions are. I think we get into, I see a lot of wholesalers get into trouble when they try to position themselves as the end buyer. And mm -hmm. then, you know, like you mentioned, they, the seller sees the property on, on the MLS and says, wait a minute, I thought you were buying the property. So how do you broach that conversation with sellers? Let's say, you know, they agree to a price, you send the contract and they say, wait a minute, what is, what is this like wholesale business? Are you not buying? What is that conversation like? Yeah. I mean, so, uh, from from time to time right sellers will have those questions that like are you guys not the end buyers or like what are you looking to do and i i just you know i'm very honest with them it's pretty self-explanatory from the letter itself uh what our business model is but uh you know if some sellers do have questions I'm, I'm happy to answer them and you know most of the time you'd be very surprised the sellers don't really care uh they just want to get rid of it you know as long as they get their price they're happy um, but sometimes, you know, sellers will have objections and in which case, no hard feelings. We can go our separate ways. Not, not the seller for us, right? Not the seller for us. Not the, not the motivated seller. That's it. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So, um, in your opinion, where do you see the market going now and what are you planning to do or what types of things are you doing right now to thrive in that market shift? Very good question. Uh, I, I have noticed the return on mail going down. So, you know, uh, the cost of direct mail has gone up a lot in the last two years with inflation and, you know, the USPS constantly giving like postage, postage, uh, postage rate increases to everyone. So like the cost of mail has gone up. Competition has gone up. Uh, you know, you, you, it's no longer viable to buy land for 20, 25% of, of, of market value because there's just too many people competing. Um, so, so, so I have noticed that when I first got into the business for every $1 in mail, I'd make 10 in revenue. Now it's probably closer to like three to five in revenue. So, you know, the margins definitely have gotten lower. And I, I, I also think, you know, maybe that's partly due to the way the economy has shifted uh, with interest rates going up and uh, just, just the whole situation that we're in right now. I do think that it'll get better with time because, you know, you have a bunch of people trying to get into the business and they're sending out 5,000, 10,000 mailers seeing that, hey, this doesn't work. It's not making me, me money and, and, and they're giving up. And eventually you'll have enough people leave the business to where it's profitable again and, and it makes it, the margins make sense. So I think it's just, it's just a matter of time, you know, every business kind of goes through this transition. Yeah. That's a really good bit of insight. Um, mm -hmm. What are you finding? I know it's different in every market, but what are you finding typically to be the average of um, your ratio from mailers to deals? So how many mailers does it take to get one deal typically for you? 
Yeah, uh, this again has changed so much uh, from when I first got in and it, I, I would do one deal for every two to 3,000 mailers. Now it's probably one deal for every 10,000 mailers. Yeah, 10,000 mailers. So for those people that are listening to this, um, you know, that's a lot of mail to get one deal. And especially if you're looking at, you know, 55 cents, 60 cents a, a mailer, you're looking at over $5,000 to get one deal, right? It's, it's pretty crazy, pretty crazy. So, uh, so let's talk a little bit about, I'd like to shift gears. What do you find to be the most important needle moving activities that you can take daily as a newbie in this business? Uh, I think the, the best thing is just taking action, you know, uh, Firstly, is getting all the systems set up, getting your phone system set up, your CRM, your website, uh, getting all the fundamentals necessary for a scalable business. And the second thing would be to send mail. Um, because if you send mail, everything else takes care of itself. If you send mailers, you're going to be forced to, to, to talk to people and people call you. You have now have to respond to them. So you're going to be forced to talk to people. You're going to be forced to get deals on the contract. Then you're going to be forced to sell those deals. And then you're going to be forced to make revenue. So essentially, by sending out mail, you're forcing yourself to make money by doing all the other steps that naturally come along with it. So sending mail is, is probably the best thing that you can do. Excellent. And what do you consider to be the biggest challenge in the land business? Uh, the biggest challenge um, is, you know, I think just competition. Uh, right now, competition, the state of the market, uh, the, the situation that we're in. Uh, the cost, cost of mail going up, uh, the cost per deal going up. But I think all of this will eventually uh, even out. And um, yeah, I, 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 th I think it's just a matter of time. Excellent. Yeah. And so talking about competition, I do want to uh, chat with chat on that a little bit. Um, what do you think that you do differently than others in the land space that contributes to your success in your business? Very good question. Uh, I think the, the biggest thing is I don't give up. Uh, if a mailer fails, I send another big mailer. If that one fails, I send another one. And I just I just keep hitting the hammer, you know, till till I start getting deals and just having that thing of just not not giving up. And, you know, August has been a really good month for me uh, because, you know, the Initially, in the beginning of the year, it was slow, but then I just kept mailing, 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 and now I'm seeing all those deals kind of come to fruition. So, um, yeah, I think just persistency, uh, persistence uh, is is probably the biggest one. I think that's great. And so, let's say a mailer, uh, you know, mail campaign doesn't work. Do you send to the same uh, to that same target market, or you just send somewhere else? What's that um, like for you? Yeah, I. I have enough states and data to mail where I don't have to mail the same person twice for a long time. And I try to mail different states and different areas so I can get a sense of what mail, what states I have more success in and which ones work better. And then maybe two years later, I'll remail that state again. Um, so, so yeah, that's typically how I do it. Excellent. And uh, what's your favorite thing about the land business? Uh, favorite thing is that I can do it virtually. Uh, uh, I currently <laughs> reside in London and I'm I'm closing deals in the U.S. and I think that's just phenomenal. You know, when when I tell people here that I buy and sell land in the U.S., I think they can't really wrap their head around how sitting in London from my computer I can buy and sell land in the U.S. But you know, I think technology is so amazing these days. Uh, I've I've closed deals at ski resorts. I've closed deals on beaches. Uh, of course, deals and like the most randomest of places, um, you know, because title companies, they can sell mobile notaries to you anywhere. Uh, and, you know, now you can even notarize documents online. So literally sitting from your laptop, you can close land deals. So it's just it's just phenomenal. Yeah, it really is remarkable. That's definitely one of my favorite things about the land business, how yeah. how virtual friendly it is. So, yeah. you know, I get a lot of people that reach out to me that might be living in, you know, that are living overseas, Germany, Spain, lots of different places, mm -hmm. and they want to do deals in the U.S. And so um, 
what type of advice would you give to those people just in terms of setting up and organizing things? What are the fundamental things that they need to have in place to be successful flipping land overseas in the U.S.? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll just start off by saying that I, I'm not a lawyer, so that this is not legal advice, but this is just what's worked in my experience. So I, 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 I am a U.S. citizen and I was living in the U.S. before, so it was very easy for me to get U.S. bank accounts, set up a U.S. LLC, um, you know, and, and, and do all of that. So I think that makes it a lot easier. I'm not sure if I know people sitting in foreign countries or flipping land in the U.S., but I think the way they've been doing it, from my understanding, is they're partnering with their real estate agents. They're finding local Americans that they can partner with and then doing like a, a profit sharing. And, and that's how they're able to or they're just paying them like a fixed fee per closing or per transaction or just an annual fee to like use them to have have all the systems in place. But you definitely need someone in the U.S. to like help you with setting all these things up. Got it. And so just so we have an idea of what your daily action looks like, can you walk us through a little bit about what types of what types of things do you do in your business on a daily basis? So uh, for me, I, I will log into the CRM and I'll just look at, you know, what deals we have on the contract to purchase, what deals we have on the contract to sell. What are the upcoming closing dates? How much money we're going to make? Um, and then just looking at mailing, uh, you know, scrubbing lists and, and getting my mailers ready. I send mailers once a month. So uh, I oftentimes plan those uh, well in advance. But uh, yeah, just getting the mailers ready and then just talking to my team, making sure everything is going well, addressing their concerns. Sometimes a unique situation will come up where they don't really know how to handle it. So they'll, you know, come to me and ask for my advice. But uh, I, I'd say they're pretty good and I've spent a good amount of time training them so they can take care of most, most things themselves. Excellent. Yeah, that training is so huge. So mm -hmm. when, you, when you start thinking about, um, you know, managing people, creating a team, training, what are some of the biggest challenges that you found to uh to get a team to you know operate at a high level yeah i think this business requires you to have uh very good management skills because like there's a lot of deals a lot of sellers a lot of transactions you have to be very detail oriented and have to be someone that's very much on top of things and if you're not it's very easy to like slip behind so this is an issue I had with like the, some of the previous transaction coordinators that I hired. They weren't very proactive. They were very passive. They wanted me to give them instruction. And if there was nobody watching over them, they wouldn't be working. And that's just a recipe for disaster. Um, you know, and we get calls that weren't being answered for, you know, days and weeks at a time. And, you know, yeah, that's the last thing. expiring. Yeah, yeah. There's just so last much thing that you want business. with a transaction coordinator is someone. Exactly. You know, yeah. <laughs> I want someone that's operating like four weeks from now today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want someone that can work from home and still be productive. So I, I think that has been the biggest challenge. <laughs> I but, definitely uh, get that. Definitely get that. So um, what is something in your opinion that not many people are talking about in the land industry right now that we should be talking about? Uh, something that not enough people are talking about. Um I feel like just the state of the economy and the markets and how that's changing things and, you know, what are going to be like the, the next biggest areas to mail, uh, how much we should be offering, you know, how much other people are offering, you know, sharing notes on, on things like that. I think people, when it comes to like where they mail, people tend to be uh, very secretive, like nobody wants to give out their secrets and no one wants to invite competition, but um I feel like, you know, it, it really does make everyone better because, you know, you have states like uh, Arizona and Nevada that have just been so heavily mailed that it's just, it's, uh, it's kind of killed it for, 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 for everybody now, you know, and I think by just having better communication, um, we can, we can make the community a lot better for, for, uh, for everyone involved. Yeah, I love that. Making sure that the community is improving and is better for everyone involved. Definitely, definitely love that. All right. So tell me, what is your superpower? My superpower? Um, 
I think the biggest thing is the ability for risk and the ability to just keep mailing and uh, not giving up. And also, I'm 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 an Excel ninja, <laughs> very good at Excel. Excel ninja. <laughs> I spent a lot of time. Like I was using the mouse initially, and I, I worked at a private equity company for a little bit, and they like like really scolded me and they're like you're not allowed to use the mouse anymore just learn how to use all the keyboard short shortcuts and as soon as i did that it's helped me tremendously in this business i can scrub lists very fast uh thanks to not using the mouse anymore so i'd say that's probably one of my superpowers yeah i love it i love it you're yeah. one of those guys that just no mouse it's just all on the keyboard <laughs> all, on the keys, all the keys exactly that's, that's a major flex armand definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> definitely a flex so where are you pulling your data from? What's your what's your list source? So I was using Data Tree for the longest time. And recently I've been using Price. Uh, it's just, you know, they don't have, I noticed they don't have as many leads as Data Tree does, but it's still it's still good enough for me. Um and, and it's just convenient instead of initially I was downloading it from Data Tree because I thought Data Tree had more leads, which when I run the count, Data Tree did have more leads. And so I'd download the list, upload it into price, have them price it for me, and then I'd mail it. But I just found that it's just it's it simplifies my life if I just get the list directly from price, then maybe I mail more states and more areas. So that that's how I've been doing it right now. Excellent. Excellent. And I want to jump back to uh, your team really quickly. So you mentioned that they're on commission only, right? So it's kind yes. of like kill what you eat type thing. Sure. So how did you go about building your team and how did you find the people because it is a very specific type of person who's okay yes. with having a commission only so do they do other jobs or can you talk to us a little bit about that yeah so uh i found uh people who basically were you know right now in the job market we're, we're at an interesting time where i think it's become a lot easier to, to to find staff like a lot of people have been laid off from from their companies and people are looking for it pretty eagerly so i think it is easier to find people now than than it was maybe last year or two years ago um for me the way i've structured it is i pay them so my coo gets 10 percent of revenue and my c and the transaction coordinators get five percent of revenue and uh the 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 end goal is to have four tc so one for each region of the us one for each time zone and uh the coo would look over all the tc so the tcs would be responsible for calling the sellers when the calls come and responding to emails taking the transaction from start to finish the coo would be responsible for fielding offers deciding which offers we take uh helping make strategic decisions on where to mail how much to mail tracking kpis uh making sure the tcs are doing their job um but right now we just have one uh i have one co and one tc so basically 15 percent of all the wholesale revenue that comes in goes to my staff and then 85 percent goes for me and the cost of the mail and data and all the softwares and everything else excellent very good what's your definition of success uh i think the definition of success you know it really varies from person to person but i think uh, for, for me, at least, it was the freedom of time and the freedom of money. Uh, and, you know, if 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 I can spend my time where I want, when I want and with whom I want that that to me success um, and just also having the the money and the freedom to like travel where you want, buy what you want, uh, do the things that really make you happy um, and just being able to like enjoy life to the fullest. I think if you can in, get that for yourself, whatever that means to you, then I think you're a successful person. Yeah, I love that. Now, a lot of that resonates with me. Freedom is definitely a core value for me as yeah. well. I definitely understand that. Uh, are there any types of um, entrepreneurs, business owners, could be in the land industry, could be in different industry, but who do you like to follow? Who, like whose teachings do you like a lot in the, in the business space? Yeah, there's there's quite a few. Um, I love Napoleon Hill, uh, his books, uh, Think and Grow Rich. That one had a huge impact on me. Um, I'm reading this book right now. It's called Outwitting the Devil. That that's a really good one as well. Um, I love you know Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Read that years ago. I think that one also had a huge impact on me. Um, I like Alex Hormozzi. I love following him on Instagram. He he has like just really good insights on business and life. Uh, uh, Grant Cardone, um, 
Graham Stephan. There's there's just a bunch of different people that I follow on YouTube and uh, just podcasts as well. Yeah, excellent. I love that. This is one of my favorite topics when it comes to uh, talking to other business owners is that mindset piece, right? Like mm -hmm. there's so much mindset that goes into this. So um, can you talk a little bit about what your mindset is like and how that's contributed to the success of your business? Definitely. Um, I think my mindset was uh, shaped, you know, I, I definitely had this drive in me that that I wanted to be successful. I think what it came down to was just having a really good framework to do that. And when I read Think and Grow Rich, it basically told me to uh, set goals and write down uh, basically what my goals are for the month, the quarter, the year. And so I'd write those down. And every morning when I'd wake up, I would have a piece of paper next to my bed. And I'd, I'd read those. I'd like verbally read those goals out loud when I'd wake up and right before I go to bed. And subconsciously, it does something to your mind where naturally you get closer and closer to that goal. And all your actions you take throughout the day get you closer to that to that goal. Um, so I would just write down big picture what the goals are and then just backtrack and say, okay, if I want to make X amount of revenue, I need to send X amount of mail. This is how much I'm going to send every month. And then just going about doing that work and being structured about it. Um, I think, you know, so, the, so thinking grow rich really helped me build that structure to be successful. And then Grant Cardone, 10X rule, um, you know, just always wanting to 10X myself. Uh, I think those two things contributed greatly. Yeah, that's fantastic. You know, I love getting the subconscious mind involved with, you know, the, all of the goals that you have and gosh, Grant, he's just amazing. Um, yeah, I, I loved him on uh, Undercover Billionaire. That was, did you, yeah. get to see that? Remarkable. I have, I have. And, 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 and I think, you know, in, in business, you have two types of knowledge. You have general knowledge and you have specific knowledge. And, you know, specific knowledge is really what makes you wealthy, but general knowledge is what gives you the mindset. So all these books I mentioned, they're great for general knowledge, but the specific knowledge comes from land specific courses and, and uh, things like that. So I think you really need a mix of both to be successful. Yeah, I love that. I love that dichotomy of general knowledge, specific knowledge, bring those together yeah. in combination, right? So what's the biggest surprise that you've had so far in your land career? The biggest surprise um, is, you know, I think when I was going into big old deals, there was just so much fear, um, you know, that, that things would go wrong or that it would be so much harder. But I think uh, one of the biggest things is that it takes the same amount of time, effort to, to do a deal where you make three grand or 30 grand. I think that to me was like the, the biggest surprise and also that there's nothing to be afraid of. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it, it's just numbers and you're doing the same thing, but you're just doing it at a different scale. So I think to me, that was like a, a very big surprise. And also that wholesaling is like workable, you know, that, that you can actually do it. You can actually make money without investing money. I think that to me was also uh, pretty eye opening. Yeah, it's a really remarkable model for sure. Yeah, super, yeah. super fantastic for leveraging. And so if you could go back and tell yourself three pieces of advice when you were a brand new land baby, what would they be? Uh, I think the first one would be to uh, hire people sooner. Is I waited five years to start hiring COOs and TCs, and I should have done this a long time ago. Like I, you know, I hurt myself because you know, had I just hired these people before, I would have been able to send way more mail. Like I would have been able to send 50, 60,000 mailers three years ago. I didn't have to wait to do it right now. So I think I really hurt myself by wanting to do everything myself. And I was kind of interfering in the way of my own success, telling myself things like, but other people won't be able to do it as well as you. No one's going to care for your business like you will care. And, you know, I was, I was deluding myself and I was getting in the way of my own success. And while I was very successful and I did very well, I was capping myself. So I think the biggest thing I would I would do is like as soon as I got the proof of concept and I figured out that the business was working, I should have invested in into actually building systems instead of trying to do the things myself. Like, you know, if you're doing the same thing over and over again, you should either hire someone to do it or automate it. But yeah, so I, I think that that would be like, I think the, the biggest thing that I would do differently if uh, I could go back in time. Yeah, that's really, really good advice. What's your biggest passion or goal you'd like to achieve at this point in your life? Uh, the biggest passion or goal is uh, really to ramp up the passive income. So 
land has been a way that I've gotten the active income and I've taken that and invested it in self-storage and self-storage has done pretty well. Um, and, and the goal is really to, to keep ramping that, that business up to where it gives me enough passive income to where tomorrow, no matter what happens with the land business, I have a sense of security and I know that I'll be well taken care of from, from passive income. So I think that's like the biggest financial goal of mine right now. That's fantastic. Yeah. So how'd you get into self-storage? Um, again, you know, so, so, same thing. Um, I, I was just, you know, researching it online. I, I heard about it in, in a podcast. I don't know if it was Bigger Pockets or RE Tipster, but um, I, I heard about the self-storage industry and I just started researching it and I bought a bunch of books. Um, AJ Osborne's book was like a really good one, Self-Storage Income. I got that one on Amazon and I learned about the industry and um, I invested in coaches and myself and started making offers and uh i made 30 offers i got four deals on the contract and i closed on two of them and then i bought a third facility earlier this year so yeah yeah that's awesome okay. man. congrats i love that thank uh, you I just drop a coach name that you uh that you really like working with yes her name is stacy rosetti i just put it in the uh comment section awesome and yeah. i and can you pronounce her name one more time for us? Uh, Stacy Rossetti. Awesome. Excellent. Very good. Sure. Love it. So, you know, I just want to thank you so much for giving to us today. Um, how can we give back to you right now? What resources or connections are you looking for currently? Um, you know, honestly, at the moment, I'm, I'm not really looking for anything. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to help people in uh, whatever way I can. And, uh, you know, if, if anyone ever needs something or needs advice, uh, you know, people are free to reach out to me and I'm, I'm happy to help people. Love it. How And how can people reach out to you? Uh, Facebook Messenger would probably be be the best way. Just looking up my name, Armand Premji, and messaging me there, I think would be the best way. Fantastic. Thank you guys so much, Armand. I want to thank you. You've been absolutely fantastic. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, again, every week we do these on Thursdays, 6 p.m. Central. We'll see you on the next one. Be great. Have a great week and we'll catch you in the next one. Thanks so much, guys. Bye-bye. If you're interested in hearing from other six and seven figure land flippers about how they've built and run their businesses, then check out my group, Only Land Fans, where I do a live interview each week inside the group. You can grab that link at the description below. Until then, be great. Have a great week and catch you in the next one.